Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz bassist Joe Martin. We talked to him on May 26, 2020 about his latest CD in this newest surreal COVID-19 world of ours. He moved to New York City back in 1994, and his debut as a leader was Passage, a quartet album with tenor saxophonist Mark Turner, pianist Kevin Hayes, and drummer Jorge Rossi, recorded back in 2001. Since then, he has been keeping the momentum moving forward, and he's got a great story. Enjoy. First question I want to ask you is this. When okay. did you start When did you start noticing, like, mid-March that things were starting to happen? What gigs were getting canceled? How did you start kind of figuring out that we were entering this? no live jazz world uh it was it was pretty abrupt but let's say i mean because when you the time it, things it, i mean it happened so fast i mean the uh, i mean even just from the from the the leadership of the, the world leadership our own country's leadership and expert even scientific leadership i mean other than some outliers who weren't being listened to too much i mean so i let's put it this way i had a tour in europe in in february um, uh, from about the, uh, let's say the 14th of February. And I came back on the 26th of February and went to various places in Europe, uh, that were, you know, actually went, went through, through Italy, went through France, Spain, uh, Switzerland, came back on the 26th of February. And, you know, things were already happening. Uh, it was, it was definitely being talked about, but it wasn't the, the idea that it was going to be this thing that became all consuming to the world and, and shut everything again down was 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 just not in anybody's um, uh, mind at that moment. So um, we 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 did our tour. We came back. Um, we noticed in Italy they were in some airports they were taking people temperatures. Just that was for our first time. We're like, huh, that's interesting. Yeah, I hearing about this, but and then got back to New York. And then it was getting more talked about. Uh, this is like end of February, early March. And it's getting more and more talked about. Uh, I still had my last gig that I actually did was, I remember very well, it's very easy to remember now, it was March 11th. Uh, it was at a place in, in New York City. And uh, basically the week before that, yeah, things were starting to look like maybe something was going to happen, like things were going to start to get shut down. And I would say the weekend... My last gig was on March 11th. Uh, then I was supposed to go out of town in the States that weekend, the 13th. Uh, I think the, I think I was supposed to leave on Friday. And I got a call like Thursday night, like saying like the whole thing was in jeopardy, like one of the venues had bailed out. And then by, by Friday morning, it was all off. And then by Saturday, I think I had like at least the next two months of work canceled. And that was just like in that sort of 24 to 48 hour period. And uh, so, and then, I mean, I'm, I'm then on top of that, you know, I have, have young children who go to school in New York City, in the New York City public system. And uh, that whole week of, I guess it's the 9th of March, that was when things really went from like, you know, a, almost a complete 180, where we went from like, uh, this isn't whatever, this may be something, whatever, it's not going to be a big deal to like by 13th, though, that from the Monday to the Friday, all the parents Many of the parents were saying, like, who's going to keep putting their, their kid in school next week? Because they hadn't officially shut down the school system yet. And they finally did on the Sunday of that weekend. So that would have been around the 15th. Uh, Mayor de Blasio finally decided he needed to shut it down. Uh, they, he was really re resisting for a number of reasons. Um, but um, but it's, it's not a simple thing to do. But anyway, it was basically that whole week from about the, that second week of March that everything just went from, like, you know, left to right. and and um, and uh, it was suddenly just kind of very daunting prospect that, you know, there might not be any gigs. They're not, not only are there not any gigs this, you know, week or next week, but there may not be any gigs for a while. And then, you know, as March continued on early April, it really became the, the heavy daunting um, uh, weight on all of our backs as artists and musicians that we weren't going to be working for an indefinite period. And, um, and, you know, it's, and it's, it's still going on. I mean, maybe there's some, some light at the end of the tunnel, but I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure, uh, what it's going to be. Well, and you have an album that's coming that, that, you know, out during this time of quarantine. That's to be bittersweet. People have latitude to listen to music more, but you also can't back it up live. What are your thoughts on that? My most recent album as a leader actually came out last year. So I, I was, it came out in, pretty much in front of the pandemic. However, I was supposed to do quite a bit of 
um, band leading in this period. So I would, the first week of April, I was scheduled to be in Europe as a leader with my band, um, playing all over the place for about eight days. And, um, uh, yeah, that was the other thing that was going on in March. It's just like, is this going to happen? Is this not going to happen? And I mean, even into the second week of March, I don't think it had officially been canceled, but and the first gigs were in Northern Italy. So I was, you know, this is when Italy's really getting, you know, starting to get hit with it, you know, and, uh, but it's amazing how it, it took a while for it to actually officially the whole thing to be officially canceled. But um, so that that happened. So that um, was a big drag because I'm I've been the last, gosh, I don't know, the last decade. I mean, I do leader gigs in New York mostly, and I try to put out a record <laughs> not super often, but once in a while. And uh, I re- I was really looking for it. I'd really put a lot of uh, energy and time and just sort of mental. Um, that's how I say create a focus into to finally being a band leader again as a bass player. And so I had this tour organized and we were scheduled to play in June at the Village Vanguard. And and uh, both of these things are, you know, the, the tour in, in Europe obviously was canceled. And then, so it, it's been, a, it's, it's been pretty rough for me that way. I mean, I, I don't want to complain too much because, um, you know, I'm okay. My family's okay. We have some, um, uh, you know, we're not out on the street. Fortunately, we have a two-income household, so um, uh, we have my wife's uh, job, which is still going full full steam ahead. So it's um, I'm not as, in as bad a shape as some people, but from a just sort of a musical and, and creative um, aspect, it, it, it really um, <laughs> really put, took me down uh, to a dark place for a while, and and um, <laughs> basically just kind of gotten used to this this situation as much as one can get used to this because it's extremely surreal and bizarre, but uh, I try not to think t- too much about it, um, go down those uh, those black holes and think about it too much because I have done that with friends uh, on my own, just like getting really depressed about the, the whole situation. But um, at the same time, trying to find outlets for, for myself, I mean, it's been a time to, um, uh, plenty of time to reflect, plenty of time to um, do some just practicing of the instrument in a way that I haven't in a long time, you know, there's, there aren't other people's gigs, you know, most of the time I'm playing with a lot of other bands and that music sort of keeps me, that's sort of the pipeline that keeps me in the flow of working on things. And, and now it's been, you know, three months of, of just being, you know, on my own with the instrument and, you know, you can connect online with people to some degree, do little tracking projects with people. Um, but it's, it's, it's tough, but, uh, but it's just, you know, I, that's, that, that's been an interesting thing and maybe, and not necessarily a bad thing, I guess, but, but, but I think the hardest thing for all of us as musicians and artists is, you know, when will this end? When, when can you descend back into the basement clubs, the, the small venues all over the world in the cities and all over the world and, and play this music live because it's, it needs to be played live at the social music and, uh, it's, it's pretty rough when our, um, the places that we normally work are, are not available to us. And so that's, I think the thing that can really spin you into a, um, a dark place if you think too hard about it. But I'm just trying to, um, you know, take it a day at a time and, uh, I have my family that I also needs me and, you know, I have young kids to take care of. So it's, it's, there, there are, there are some positive things that have come out of it. But on the artistic side, it's, it's been a, a real challenge. So let's go back to your beginnings. Talk to me about where you were born and raised and how jazz became this path that you chose. So um, I was born in Kansas City. I don't know if that's something you knew, and, and maybe why you. I don't. I don't know how you how you know about me, but but uh, I guess if you looked up on a on a Joe Martin bio, you would see that I was born in Kansas City, but I didn't live there very long. I lived there for about six months. My my parents were were living there. My dad was finishing a, um, a, a doctoral degree, I think at the the the, the conserv. I want to say Kansas City Conservatory or something like that, and. Um, and so I was born there. I lived there for about six months, and then he got a job in a small town in Iowa uh, at a college there, Central College, in a, in a town called Pella, Iowa, which is about, I don't know, three, three and a half hours by car north of Kansas City. And that's where I grew up. I grew up, um, so my father's a classical musician, um, clarinetist, and music history professor, um, and and my mother, an amateur violinist, she came from a musical family. Her sister, both of her sisters did some singing. I mean, not super professionally, but 
but definitely in the family. And uh, so I just grew up in a musical household, and my dad's dad, my grandfather, was kind of a show tunes, jazz pianist, weekend warrior type person. He was also an instrument repair man and kind of jack of all trades. And so my dad had a lot of jazz records, uh, even though he wasn't a jazz musician himself. So grew up along that. They started me on the cello when I was a little kid, maybe when I was about seven or eight. I started on the cello and um, played that for a number of years. Uh, I was and then, but you know, it was a small town in Iowa, so there was no orchestra program. So I played the trumpet. I just used a band instrument if I wanted to play an instrument in school. So I chose the trumpet. Played that for a while. That got braces. I was I was a I was a good musician. I had talent, but I was the trumpet was not for me. It's a it's a, I have all great respect for trumpet players because the that's that's got that's one of the most for me one of the most difficult instruments. Knowing it just a little bit, it's the amateur stuff and the physicality of it. So. Anyway, the good news about that was it, it, it kind of, I was getting frustrated with that, and there was an electric bass at, at my school, at my, in my high school, and uh, I just started messing around with it on my, I get what you would call study hall time, like when you had free time, I'd go to the band room, I just kind of play it. I had my, one of my friends was learning how to play the drum kit, I just kind of jam on it, and my, I guess my cello background, you know, it helped me with a string, some familiar with a string instrument, four strings, uh, tuning, obviously different. Uh, force for the bass, fist for the cello, but you know there was some familiarity, and it was just finally there was an instrument that um, I, I just I just got really into it. I took it home one summer between my freshman and sophomore year of high school. My aunt, my band director, um, his name was Dick Redman. He, he encouraged me to just take it home for the summer and whatever, have fun with it. And then I came back in the in the fall of my sophomore year, and then auditioned for the school jazz band and got in and was playing electric bass and 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 started messing around on the on the upright as well um and uh i i guess by the time i was yeah 17 or 18 i i, I was just i'd really fell in, fallen in love with the instrument i loved the bass i loved all things at that time it was more electric bass so i was very much into a lot of funk players and fusion players and rock players but it was leading me to jazz and i had jazz in the house and you know straight ahead jazz didn't quite speak to me at that point but i definitely had Oscar Peterson records to listen to, and some Miles Davis and John Coltrane records. Um, uh, Bill Evans trio, my dad liked all those records, so I was hearing it. And then by the time I went to college, I went to college uh, my first two years uh, in Chicago at DePaul University, and I studied with a great bass teacher or bass player in New York, in sorry, in Chicago, named Larry Gray, who's a great teacher and he's a great musician, still around, and very active on the scene in Chicago. Studied with him for a couple of years, and then I was just really getting into the acoustic side of the, instrument, of the music, much more into jazz, acoustic music, and uh, less less interested in the electric. I, I I love all things bass, but I was my my mind was growing and my ears were expanding, and I I just wanted to figure out how to play the double bass. And uh, after two years at DePaul, I um, although studying with Larry was great, it wasn't really the place for me. It, it was hard to figure out where I fit in the, the jazz program didn't have a lot of um strong young players uh and it was sort of overshadowed by their more classical conservati conservatory um side at that point and uh, and i was already i started to, i i mean i played in the orchestra i wasn't a music major yet either i i played in the orchestra and i was playing in the jazz band and taking lessons but i was like you know what i don't want to and then i visited i i had run into a few met a few players in in um in Chicago, who um, had gone to school, they were young players who moved back to Chicago. They were from there, but they had gone to school out on the, on the East Coast. Uh, a couple of them at William Patterson College, uh, a couple of them at Manhattan School of Music. Anyway, I was starting to jam a little bit uh, in, while I was still in Chicago, and, and I met these guys, and and they said you need to go. They just told me like you you should just get out of Chicago as soon as possible. This is not this is not this is not putting down Chicago at all because it was really a great place for me at that time. But this is a long. This was quite a while ago. This was like in the early '90s, like um, and uh, and uh, so I went and visited on a long weekend. I went out to New York and visited William Patterson College and Manhattan School of Music, and uh, I heard the, the level of young players there who were, and it was really and especially Patterson had a really specific. It was really the jazz program was kind of their star program of the music department and and just heard a bunch of really great players and great groups and and rufus reed was the uh, director of the program at the time and he had invited me to i'd send him a tape and he invited me to come out so i was very for me i was very i was very impressed by that i was kind of in awe uh new york was still kind of like a dream 
an abstract dream in my head, but it was like a, a first step towards going there. And um, I visited that that weekend, and I and um, uh, I as I when I went back, I was just pretty certain that I was going to leave uh, Chicago and, and finish school out there. And so that's what I ended up doing. So yeah, my junior and senior year of college, I transferred out to William Patterson and 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 just really hunkered down and you know practiced really hard for two years and just only did music and. And after I graduated, I, I just decided I'd come that far. Uh, I, I'm not going to come 20 miles from New York City and, and go back to the Midwest at this point, at least not yet. And so I decided to figure out how I could move to um, New York after I graduated. So, And that was in 1990, um, end of 93, early 94. So, Right on. What was the first live jazz show you saw that really kind of got you thinking you want to do this? Oh, live jazz show. Well, it would have been, um, let's see, let me think about that. There's a few. So when I was a, you know, a middle schooler, probably, in, and even early high school, I think the first bands we saw were things that would come through this, through Iowa. So I saw the Woody Herman band a couple times. I saw the Buddy Rich band a couple of times. Um so those those were kind of early things. I'm trying to think. I'm sure I'm going to miss something, um, but I definitely saw those groups when I was a, and then when I was a senior, yeah, early my senior year in high school. So this would have been in, in 1988. Um, Miles Davis played at um, Hancher Auditorium in Iowa City, and and my parents took me to see that. So I guess I was probably 17. And I remember I I traded. We got there and we had my parents bought tickets and I don't I, I I for some reason I went to the box office to see if I could get it because we were up in the balcony and I went to the box office to see if I could get a closer seat and they just traded my ticket and gave me like a front row seat so I sat in the front row for Miles Davis like in nineteen ninety wow. so I would say and that was the band it was Kenny Garrett was kind of his early tenure in the band. It was just around the time or just before the record Amandala came out. So anyway, I, I mean, for me, that was like, uh, I mean, that was like seeing a God, you know, <laughs> that was, that was a, that was kind of, kind of beyond uh, um, anything that I could imagine at that point. And so that made a huge impression on me. Um, but I was already getting into it. I mean, definitely seeing those big bands, of course. I mean, that. And there was also there was some live music in Des Moines, which is about a an hour drive from where I was from. But I I in, and there was actually there was a little bit of a scene there, so even that inspired me to some degree. But I would I guess I would say the first groups I saw um, were yeah those big bands. I'm trying, I'm sure there's something that I'm forgetting, but I'm, that's that's what I remember: Woody Herman, Buddy Rich, and then seeing Miles when when I was like 17. Um, yeah, because in Iowa they're just you know they've um, it was, it's just it was just hard to there wasn't a lot that would come through other than through colleges so and so we there would be they, they would have guests that where my parents taught that would sometimes come through like a guest artist but you know it wasn't the same as seeing them with their own band so yeah so that's what I remember you know we're going to get to the end of this COVID nineteen and when we do what what do you hope both the musician and the crowd realizes about this absence of live jazz and living through. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think as I mean, musicians is just um, reaffirming the fact, uh, you know, how much we we need to play with people, and how much this is like I said before, this is really a social music that needs. Uh, uh, you need other musicians to play it, but you also need an audience, and and even though the the audience for jazz is, you know, it's not like uh, an arena crowd in a in a rock, you know, in a rock stadium most of the time, it's like you need that. That communication, you know, that's what it thrives in. That's where it's meant to be. So, um, creating, you know, it, it's, you know, the 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 side is that it's come out during the COVID is that we're all kind of isolated and still working on our craft, and and perhaps there will be some really interesting new music that comes out. I'm sure many people are, are writing music and collaborating in different ways, and and that's kind of some of that you can already see online. But um, I hope that. Just to, uh, in our sort of social media, internet-driven world that we live in now, that, that everybody realizes how much they just need to be listening to live music and 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 be in that in that kind of environment. And there's just no replacement for that. Um, I mean, that's certainly how I feel. And as musicians, I just I hope that um, 
I mean, what will we learn from this? I mean, I think we'll just value our chances to play even more. Um, uh, that's for sure. Uh, and I think that when when we can get back out there playing in live situations, I mean, I think, <laughs> you know, other than being very rusty when we first start playing, uh, the music will probably explode, you know, because everybody's going to just be so happy to play, uh, myself included. I mean, that's it's going to be kind of a, a rediscovery in a way just to, to interact musically with with people in real time because that's that's really hard to do now unless you have really fancy um um computer equipment with fast internet (laughs) and even that it's just tricky so so tell me this everyone has a perception of you your family your friends your fans but you're the one living your life who do you think you are (laughs) who do i think i am um wow tough question maybe i have to think about that for a second um well, I'm somebody who I think, fortunately for myself, I, I'm happy that I, I found something that I really love to do uh, when I was still in my teens that drove me enough to, to figure out a way to, to, to make that work for me in my, um, in my professional life. So uh, I, I think there's some um, sort of authenticity in that and, and honesty. Um, you know, I'm I'm uh, in in the sense of like pursuing something you love, and and no matter how difficult it is, the the fact that you love to do it is something that has a, a lot of uh, intrinsic value, um, and it's very important because hopefully you'll be a more productive um, member of the let's say the, the global community if you're doing something that you really like. Um, and I don't want to say that in a way that sounds, uh, you know, arrogance or or whatever, you know, because not not everybody necessarily find something that they love to do in their life but um but hopefully they it, at minimum they, at least something that they enjoy on some level so who am i um so that's that's part of me and then gosh i don't know that's 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 a tough question i would have had to have thought about that but maybe that's uh, intentional on your side to, to to get me to say something spontaneous but uh, i don't know if there's enough in what i just said or if you want me to try to no i think i more. think that's the thing it almost seems like there needs to be more to that, but that's usually the guttural answer is the right one. So yeah, you nailed it. Um, well, hey, man, thank you for taking some time out to talk to Neon Jazz today. I appreciate I, it. I appreciate it too, Joe. Uh, very, very anytime. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Joe for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.